Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. And, uh, hey, we want to thank our sponsor, J Radio. J Radio is an online music platform, and uh, they have all kinds of music. You can go to jradio.com and find a playlist that fits the mood that you're in. If it's classical, if it's hard rock, if it's Brian's favorite reggae, man, that's my favorite right there. It, Brian, you, you got a good yeah. favorite on that one. Buffalo Soldier, Dread Like a Rasta. You got to love reggae, man. <laughs> Every little thing is going to be all right. Hey, uh, Jimmy Buffett's new album comes out on May the 19th. Just thought I'd let you know. Excited you about You know, I that. don't know that I've ever listened to a Jimmy Buffett song all the way through. What? Mm-hmm. We How still you, like you. But that is a different J Radio? character flaw. But <laughs> you can go to jradio.com and hear all kinds of platforms. You can download it on your iTunes or Google Play Music. And it's J Radio, a sponsor of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Y'all ready to go? Let's go. Absolutely. Let's go. Three. You know what makes women stupid is college. Jesus was not a bartender. Hi, man. Two. You have lost your mind. Long tongue heifers have given me a lot more trouble than heifers wearing breeches. And you know that. Say amen like that. One. Let me tell you something, bozo. There'll be seven frosties in hell for this boy who puts on a pair of pink underwear. Amen. I sucked my thumb till I was 14 years of age. All right. Welcome to the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast. We are glad you are here with us today. We're your hosts. I'm JC. This is Nathan and Brian. Fellas, good to see you. Man, it's good to see you. That that intro never gets old. I love that so much. If I have to be honest, I've listened to it over and over <laughs> and over again. I love it. Is it is straight gold. It makes me smile ear to ear every single time I hear it. I love it. You know, we've thrown around the idea of, of changing it up and adding some different things in there because we've got a lot of freedom, but it's so good. I just don't want to mess with it. Solid gold. Hey, man. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> love it. I love the little time. I sucked my thumb till I was 14 years old. <laughs> and, oh, goodness gracious. Hey, by the guys. way, you said at one point in time you were going to give away a free T-shirt, I think it was, to whoever guessed who that was. Did anybody ever guess who it was? They did. I don't think – who was it? Do you remember? No, but I don't. I, we need to find out if we ever sent him a T-shirt because I remember him messaging us. Well, let's do this. <laughs> I got an. I got a better idea, and and y'all tell me what you think about this. We'll do some. We'll do a business meeting on the on the episode. Um, this is our tenth episode. We've made it to ten episodes with wow. some recovering with some RFP oh, extras thrown in there. But we're ten episodes in. What if we do a special? Ten episodes in. $10 t-shirts. We take $5 off Ooh. for everybody to get a RFP t-shirt. Absolutely. Like yeah. All let's, right. Let's do that. So go to recoveringfundamentalist.org, click on the t-shirt link, and Justin Knight, our incredible website guy, will put it up there, and uh, you can get a $10 t-shirt until the mm. next episode comes out. For the next week, you can go on, get a $10 t-shirt, and uh, support RFP. And the cool thing is you can get that baby while in quarantine. <laughs> I mean, you don't For have sure. to go anywhere. You don't have to put on a mask, not unless you're afraid of yourself. And you can get an RFP t-shirt, man. That is awesome. Man, I just thought about it. We should make some RFP mask because Ooh. we know everybody's going to be talking about taking your mask off. Christian's been doing it forever. And we can say, we got an <laughs> RFP mask on. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love it, man. I am just happy that the sun is out and it's hot and I'm able to mow my yard and get out and actually get burnt. So we've been doing church in our backyard. Um, I've been inviting my neighbors over. I've said, hey, we can't meet, but I'm going to set a TV and a sound system up in my backyard. And so every Sunday we're sitting back there and my head gets fried on Sundays. And uh, it's awesome though. I had a neighbor, I am not even kidding, had a neighbor sitting on their back porch. I've got a big backyard and the, the house is behind us. They kind of face our backyard. And uh, we're sitting there right in the middle of church. I heard a dude crack open a cold one. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Homeboys <laughs> drinking a beer while watching church. Like, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was was really good. Nate, you've been back to church for the last couple of weeks. How's that been going? Yeah, this this week is going to be our third week back. It's going really well. Our uh, A lot of our people 
are still worried about coming back. So they're still at home streaming, but uh, a lot of people have come back to the church and are absolutely loving it. A lot more have said they're going to be here tomorrow. So man, it's been great. Last Sunday, I actually, as soon as church was over, got through preaching, me and my wife and kids got in the car and we took my wife to the beach for Mother's Day. We drove to Gulf Shores. So my nice. forehead's still a little bit burnt, but we got down there, got two days on the beach, got to eat some seafood, got to see some family, and then came back on Tuesday. So I'm enjoying the weather as well. That's awesome. Tomorrow will be our first day back in eight weeks. Wow. We've been doing so much planning. And uh, I mean, I think we're basically going to hose everybody off with hand sanitizer, wrap them up <laughs> like a mummy. I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but it's going to be it's going to be interesting. But you know, when you've got hundreds and hundreds of people coming into one spot yeah, and you know, there's a lot of fear around, you know, so I'm excited. It was weird stopping having services. And now it feels odd knowing that tomorrow we finally get to meet in person, but I'm excited. Yeah. Brian, I know you really well, and I guarantee you're, you're just going to stay up all night at church. You're not going to be able to sleep. You're so excited about tomorrow. Oh, man, I am thrilled. You know, years ago, I heard this joke said this guy came up to the pastor at the close of a service, and the pastor kept on saying, you know, during the service, he said, I'm a pig farmer. You know, I have I have pigs. And he said, if I, if I holler and, you know, a pig – hold it. I think I forgot the joke. <laughs> <laughs> if you think I'm going to edit that out, you're crazy. No, no, no. no that's See the no. moment. <laughs> No, that's going to be edited out. I, love I hadn't planned it. Okay. on telling that joke. Okay. Go ahead, and, go ahead and say again what you just said. Nathan. Yeah, I can't wait. I, I think I'm just going to open up the biggest can of preach I've ever opened up in my life. I think it's going to be scary for the people who are sitting in the seats tomorrow. I'm going to pour it all out. I didn't know where you were going right there, brother. I did not know where you were going. Hey, I love oh, Jesus, man. man. <laughs> Looks like we're at, so we're moving into a new building uh, here at Rockbridge, and uh, we've got a lot of exciting stuff. I just sent out a text to our group page. I was like, I miss y'all because we, we, it's like a new day for us. We've got a brand new student pastor coming on, a brand new worship leader for our student ministry. We've got a new building. Like we're using this as kind of like a relaunch, but you know, we have a lot of people that are attending and, and we're just taking it as slow as possible because there's a church here in Catoosa County that is shut down again for a month because there's some number that I don't even know. And I don't want to say on the, uh, on the episode, but at the church, a lot of people, because they've been meeting for three weeks, were exposed to four or five people that are positive for it. And so they've shut the church down for a month and said they're not allowed to have church for a month. And so that, that happened right here in Catoose County. So that kind of adds fear, you know, on top of a lot of the, the hysteria that's going around, because let's be honest, we don't know what's real, what's fake. Um, there's a lot of stuff. And I, to the point where I posted on social media today, hey, here's some social media posting guidelines. Make sure you fact check before you post it. Make sure the date, because some people are sharing stuff from like the end of you know, February. And I'm like, come on, that was February. We're in May now, you know, and that's just, that's a good rule of thumb just to think before you post. So speaking of posting, man, I am super excited about our, uh, our podcast today, our episode today. I have been looking forward to this episode for some time. Uh, we have a guest with us today that if you're on Twitter, uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of his uh, clips that are on there. Um, this guy uh, is down in Tampa, and uh, he is a pastor. And uh, we reached out to him. And, and let's be honest, we've reached out to a lot of guys because we say on the podcast that we want to help challenge and encourage we're not just about getting folks that are yes men that agree with what where we're at or the stance that we take we want folks that have a different opinion and we have reached out to a lot of guys in the ifb world and nathan rager is one of the only ones who has said yes that he would come on and uh, we're excited to have him nathan welcome to the recovering fundamentalist podcast man it's good to have you on here Hey, it's good to be here. Uh, I feel like I'm looking in a reverse mirror with y'all. Uh, this is an interesting <laughs> journey, isn't it? And that's what I love. And what we want to do right off the bat, you set us up with a softball right there. And so what we want to do is just well, anybody that comes on the, the podcast, we, we – want to hear their history and so we would love for you to take us back to Nathan Rager when he gave his life to Jesus what that was like you know where you went to college how you, you know where you grew up just your story because you're not a recovering fundamentalist you told me on Twix that you're a recovering evangelical so we are literally in opposite right there I think Nathan said it best what were you telling me earlier before we got on the episode Nathan 
Yeah, I think this is awesome that we have this interview because we have asked a lot of people to do this and they've refused or just didn't answer us back. But Nathan, we appreciate you being willing to do this, especially since we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. But I think it's healthy to have a respect, respectful conversation and uh, talk these things out. And I think a lot of people are going to respect you a lot more for coming on here. And hey, it takes a lot of courage. But uh, I think you saw before that we're not out to get anybody. We just want to have a conversation and we real excited about hearing where you came from and how you got to where you're at now. So share your journey with us. Okay, sh sure. So yes, uh, I was originally born in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania of German Anabaptist and Ulster Scott stock. My ancestors, every man in my family either joined the U.S. Army or became a German Baptist preacher. I'm like fifth, sixth, maybe even seventh generation, we're not quite sure. I'm just at least fifth from what we can trace. Uh, so anyway, that being said, uh, they became the Church of the Brethren. And uh, in when I was either six years old, probably six, but maybe seven years old, I was at summer camp and there was a, a Christian punk rocker there who brought in chick tracks, right? Chick tracks. <laughs> yes. And I didn't know what they were at the time. I believed the, the history of Jesus, but nobody ever had the gumption to tell me about hell, right? So here comes this strange bird in. He understood salvation was by grace through faith. He understood everybody deserved to go to hell. So why not say it, even to a six-year-old, right? Uh, it's like talking about making the difference. Some by kindness, some being pulled from the fire. So... I didn't want to go to hell. I got saved that day. It was probably six years old. So anyway, after that, I had never really lived for God. I was always in and out of church, and uh, I had never gotten really under convicting preaching, never felt moved in my Bible study, but I wound up going to Liberty University when I was 18. Well, I moved to Florida as a kid, and then went to Liberty University uh, when I was 18 years old, and I never got teachings about eternal security. So I didn't even know how to answer and answer the question when I got saved. It was like, because I thought I had to keep getting saved again because nobody ever taught me good doctrine, right? I mean, that's why I always get so worked up about little sermonettes for Christianettes dressed up like majorettes puffing cigarettes. <laughs> Is because you shouldn't have to go to Bible college to get eternal security, okay? I mean, you can like that, lump that, or take it across the street and dump it, but you're not doing anybody any favors, you know, by having a sweet little cup of coffee. And, I mean, it's not good. People shouldn't be getting saved again every time the altar call uh, from a hellfire and damnation evangelist comes in. Amen. Hey, man. All right, so... And Liberty really didn't do anything for me there either. But I went up there as a government major because uh, I wanted, honestly, I went up because I wanted to meet Jesse Helms. And he was the dropping a bunch of money to have the school of government named after him. So I was there for a cup of coffee uh, and or more, or more like a cup of chewing tobacco. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> coffee yet. Uh, I still was chewing until I was 21. But anyway, was spending most of my time doing political work, wound up moving to Alabama and working there for a while, got made an Alabama colonel. Uh, that was that was an interesting story. I, I'm, I, I call myself the, uh, the Clinton pardon of Southern gentility because the governor about three hours later after he made me a colonel resigned in disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Look up Robert Bentley. It was, I, I even have the postage stamp to prove my, my point there. But anyway, so uh, anyway, I wound up getting laid off from a job in 2014. I was 28 years old and it was right at the time that Ian Paisley had died. Right. And again, I want to stress this. I had never gotten under conviction under preaching. I had never been moved in my Bible reading. So I got under his preaching. Man, he preached the devil out of me. And I do believe that there is a big difference between Baptist eternal security uh, versus Calvinist uh, perseverance of the saints. Uh, because there's what is the faith? How far do you take faith alone? 
But the old vine fundamentalists, as opposed to the modern Calvinists, I think the old vine fundamentalists had more of an independent fundamental Baptist understanding on their interpretation of perseverance of the saints. And that really helped me out a lot. And I started getting into the King James, and it was one of those deals where when I was reading the modern perversions, I could understand it, but I couldn't feel it. When I was reading the King James, I couldn't understand it, but I could feel it. And so I wind up uh, getting into my, grandma, my great grandma's King James, where, where it has the little stars where it says like the word rot is works or uh, different, those sort of archaic words. So you didn't have to consult a dictionary for every four verses, right? And it really <laughs> helped me out a lot and started getting under hard preaching, getting convicted. And I, I didn't really realize that there was a difference between uh, eternal security and perseverance of the saints until I was, uh, well, and I, I answered the call to preach at that time and uh, wound up at a Southern, wound up serving and getting licensed by two Southern Baptist churches who had gone back into the convention after the conservative resurgence in the 80s or early 90s. Uh, but anyway, so what wound up happening with that was I wound up going to a Calvinist church and preaching, and I preached about in 1 John where he talks about the uh, Christians committing sins unto death, right? And uh, apparently that, that went over like a that went over like passing gas in church. And so I really started studying. And I, mean, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, just dump on anybody as far as, but I mean, they were good people. It was, it was a doctrinal dispute. It wasn't a personal dispute at this Calvinist, at this Presbyterian church that I had preached at this one time. But anyway, so that being said, I started getting out of Calvinism but I still believed in fundamentalism. I had gotten into the King James only stuff through Ian Paisley, and I believed in the fundamental separation. In fact, uh, my, I, I grew up hearing stories about how my great grandmother's brother, Wesley, who was a Church of the Brethren pastor, had retired from the ministry because he wouldn't be a part of the National Council of Churches, and how my grandpap's brother, uh, Uncle Don, was a pastor in the Brethren, which is not the Church of the Brethren, which it turned out uh, the Brethren were the conservatives that split off in the fundamentalist modernist controversy. So the fundamentalist roots were there, okay? I mean, from the chick tracks to the family background, it was all set up. And then, so in 2018, I went to the Southern Baptist Convention in 2018. Hey, look, I'm not afraid to come on and talk to y'all because I went, I went as a preacher who had preached uh, less than less than 10 full-length sermons in my entire life onto the convention floor to make a speech to defund the ERLC at the convention in 2018. And, and anyway, so what wound up happening was we thought that we were going to get about 10, 20% because that from what I was told by some people higher up who had had some high positions, that that's usually how it went when they tried to pull out of uh, some ecumenical Baptist fellowship years ago. But then, of course, Richard Land got up and made a speech, which really got everybody to vote against it. But then the next day, uh, we, we figured out how to get control of the microphones and the Q&As uh, for the entity, <laughs> head, right? So I go up there, and uh, I got a, a, a fact sheet from uh, Thomas Littleton uh, from 30piecesofsilver.com on how the ERLC had been working with some sodomite groups and how their uh, their fellows, particularly Karen Swallow Pryor, had been supporting the Revoice Conference that, quote, uh, was set up to, uh, to celebrate queer culture in the plight of LGBT Christians. And that was just awful. So anyway, I did this with the support of uh, one of the two, ch with both churches that licensed me, but anyway, th for things I can't go into, uh, Russell Moore, when this was exposed, his position actually got stronger, but Al Mahler was really the one with his back up against the wall because he falsely has that conservative reputation, and through some national politics in the convention, local politics in the convention, it became kind of problematic for 
one of the churches that I was involved with, and uh, the other church basically had noticed I had conducted myself with a lot of integrity, despite the fact that I was egged on to do this <laughs> and such, and, and it really wound up coming back on me, despite all, despite me going above and beyond to be above board with it. So uh, after, you know, trying to get me into some different churches and things, uh, and me having issues with NIV and the use of Hillsong music, and I just couldn't raise my kid around it, even though I was told, look, you know, this pastor's going to retire in two years, just try it out. And I, I, I'm in there like, no, 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 no. I mean, because I was, I was gung-ho for fundamentalism, because when I was in Dallas, I went to the uh, courthouse in Fort Worth where J. Frank Norris was put on trial two times who mm -hmm. and he was picked out of the convention for opposing the modernists back in 19 I think 22 so it was I had, and, and I was given a book about John R. Rice and I started getting into Jack Hiles preaching and and Phil Kidd preaching and Tony Hudson preaching and Curtis Hudson preaching and I'm like oh Here this go. is great <laughs> you, you know maybe I'm a little hard-headed you know but I grew up watching professional wrestling, right? So Woo! right here, like regular, like MacArthur style preaching. I don't understand the criticism that, that every IFB preacher imitates an IFB preacher because most, most evangelical preachers, they either imitate John MacArthur, Rick Warren, or uh, Matt Chandler, or Sproul. I mean, it's not a fair criticism. So, but anyway, but that being said, I was into it. And uh, so anyway, because of that, I wound up getting sent out to plant a church. And I went and uh, God provided a space. It was in the largest Greek community outside of the Mediterranean, Tarpon Springs, Florida. And it was a disaster. I mean, the Greeks were super nice, but you couldn't, ex you couldn't explain uh, the, the, the sin nature to them. You couldn't explain the sin nature to them. So what wound up happening was it was a good learning experience because I learned soul winning. I learned business structure and it had been a long time since I had even preached a sermon. I had been going out and preaching like 10 minute salvation messages at nursing homes, trying to kind of loosen up and everything. And, and then you know, so I had already had that notoriety. So when I got out on in the end of the church plant and business, uh, the heat was already on me from the convention stuff. And then I went to a Phil Kidd meeting about two weeks before we had the church opening. And he had shared a photo of us together where I thanked him for advising me and praying with me and everything. And so I inherited his trolls. And look, and it's one of those things where I've always heard uh, preachers talk about how there's, there's that like finding yourself period, right? There's that finding yourself period, getting comfortable behind the pulpit. And a lot of that, they were watching me sort of get comfortable behind the pulpit. And I was also taking a homiletics class with uh, Tony Hudson in my, uh, in my Bible college. And he's, he's a real smart fella, but what works in the Southern camp meeting setting doesn't work in an urban church setting really. So as I evolved and grew, I found that more that I would really have to watch a lot more like Jack Hiles and Tom Malone and Curtis Hudson, because when you're in an urban setting, it just doesn't work with the camp meeting guys, but any, uh, you know, the camp meeting style, but anyway, uh, so after all that, it just wasn't happening, and he, like the Bible says, Jesus said, if, if you're in a community and they don't accept you, dust off your feet and move on to the next one, which is what we did. We moved up to this little Leonard Skinner town a half hour north of there. God provided us a good space, and uh, I switched to an expository preaching style, verse by verse, precept by precept, and we are here. We've, we have the best we have the most visible church in the community big yellow sign on the main road and uh we stayed open through the coronavirus because i just had this gut feeling like you know not like a charismatic sense i got a prefix that it was a gut feeling I had voices like that before, okay? but 
it was it was like I just had this gut feeling like Jesus was going to build the church if I kept on keeping on, but I was going to be put out of the ministry if we closed. Hmm. So this was even a challenge where I saw Rodney Howard Brown, the the laughing revival heretic in Tampa, getting arrested in the next county down. And I'm just like, you know what? If I have to be arrested for this, so be it. But whatever. And, you know, the governor, he essentially took the bullet for me. The governor deemed that church is an essential service. And then it was right after that, that, that God really, that God brought us a few new families and uh, we were just out. We had our uh, first opportunity to go soul winning where we were actually able to talk to people again today. And I don't believe in keeping track of numbers. If, if somebody else does, that's okay with me. Because Jesus said that we're supposed to go out house to house, into, out into the highways and byways, preach the gospel unto every creature. You don't really know if it's a true conversion. And our rewards are eter eternal. It's their, if, if you boast about it here, your rewards are here. Right. So are they true converts? Some of them would be. Some of them wouldn't be. Uh, and then they may not even bear fruit for 20 years. I don't know. And, and also, I don't want to name his name, but there's one fellow. I did the stats on his conversions, uh, and his church in Texas would have, would have gotten everybody in his community saved about five or six times. <laughs> so I just was like, uh, we got one of those here in Chattanooga. <laughs> but so that's kind of where we're at. So things are, things are good. Things are working out. And it's, uh, and then of course we bypassed the deputation process because it was like, why travel the country begging for money for two years when you can just go out now and and do you really want to train the next generation of preachers by traveling the country trying to get people to like you i mean this is such a fundy thing to say but it's it's <laughs> for some reason there's like a cognitive dissonance in the deputation process versus the concept of hard preaching i don't get it now are you are you on um like, do churches sponsor you, or do you have a job and pastoring is, are you bivocational, or is this your full-time I am job? bivocational, yes. It's, it's like it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where we were just worked through. Apostle Paul was bivocational, and now yeah. it, it, a pastor is entitled to a salary, uh, just like the Old Testament priests were, but at the same time, he never took it when he was doing small church plants for an extended period of time, he didn't take it when there was a trust vacuum. And then the Bible also says that God gives, uh, I don't have the, I, I didn't memorize when I was young. So pardon me. I only have the gift of paraphrase. Uh, okay. He got some, say some pastors, some evangelists, some prophets as, as an ensample. So how can I ask a congregation to go soul winning when they're paying me uh, to pastor a small brand new church. It's ridiculous. It's. Hey, by the way, a minute ago, I appreciate you not calling the guy in Texas name. Yeah. I'll just say this. His numbers are a little gray. <laughs> <laughs> you know it, you know it, you nailed it. Nathan, I like you, yeah. man. You're good. I, I, this is a, this is going to be a fun. This is a fun interview. I'm, I'm thankful that you're well, on here. I'll say this. If you want to name the name, go ahead, because the fact that he endorsed uh, that, that, uh, that Born That Way Ministries yeah. is, look, I got run out of the convention over stuff like that. And the idea of mainstream IFB and the Hiles wing of all places accepting that same kind of garbage as Revoice, no, no. You, you, we can go ahead and name that name. The only reason I didn't say it is because he's got a good family who are faithfully served, and that's the only reason I didn't say it. Well, I didn't say it either. I just said his numbers were a little gray. Of course. <laughs> hey, speaking of family, speaking of family, you married? You got kids? Yeah, I'm married. I uh, got married in uh, 2014. Uh, the Lord gave us a child in 2018, uh, trusting in God for more, uh, but the Bible says about the qualifications of a pastor, husband of one wife, uh, children in subjection. So it's sort of ironic the way God think, work things out that I wouldn't be uh, in, in 
a pastor until I had that child. That's just, that's just like a proof of the calling, isn't it? I mean, where people were trying to place me in churches, you know, uh, just out of, you know, before we had the kid and then, and then the baby comes and that is when it happened. It's, it's amazing how things work. I, be, I don't, I don't believe I'm not, I'm not one of those that believes that your feeling of a God call uh, defies what the Bible says the qualifications are. Can I ask one question? Sure. Where did Tony Hudson preach or teach homiletics? Gethsemane Bible Institute uh, in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Uh, they bring in, they bring him in from time to time to do some intensives, and he's and he. I'll say this. He, he does get a bad rap because all the stuff that's out there, a video of his, is his preaching the conferences or the revival meetings. There's a difference between pastor in a church and preaching revival meetings. And he says he, he preaches verse by verse at his church, but he, he also says that he will kick people out of the church if they record the preaching in his church. What's going on, Brian? Hold on one second. There was just gunshots outside of our church building, a bunch of them. Hold on. And I'm in oh, the what? city. It's illegal. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> Brian's going to come back. <laughs> we'll oh, edit this God. out. <laughs> he, he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> He's such right, a drama. Know. He's such a drama queen. <laughs> hold on, hold on. There's, there's gunshots. <laughs> hey, um. Following up with what he just asked there, Nathan, I'm going to play yes. a, a clip, if you're all right with that, of, of one where you said uh, theologians, they talk about hermeneutics and exegitis and stuff like that. Are you okay <laughs> with that? Yeah, yeah. My one I, got, I got the gift of one-liners before my delivery was smooth. So yeah, Dude, I right love your one-liners, man. It's, it, it's <laughs> what makes you you. Like, you're unique, man. And, you know, and, and we're going to get into this in a little bit, how we're completely opposite. Like, you know, I mean, there's things that, that – you know, we are, we are teaching as pastors, because all three of us are pastors, that you don't teach. You know, we'll get right. into that. But, but bro, I, I'm, I'm so glad you're on this. I'm, I'm liking you. You're hilarious. It's fun. Everything good, Brian? Nobody did? Hey, and I'm still with you. I'm just plugging in here. So, oh, cool. I'm still with you. I just tagged I'm sorry about Twitter. that, guys. Somebody just emptied out a gun, like, so close to the building that through my headphones with him talking and everything, I could hear it. I wanted to make sure something wasn't going down in the parking lot. Are you there well, by I'm yourself? Down. Yeah, I'm here by myself. I saw you do, like, look up. It was crazy, man. Go check it. Are you, everything good? I mean, I reckon I'm in here, so. Brian's OG. He's a well, uh, George Straight O'Leary up. Brown preached a really good sermon with a gun once. Hey, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was at that service. I was sitting on the second row next to Aaron Hampton. He pointed that gun right at me at one point. Well, to be to be fair to him, it was a single action revolver and he never pulled the hammer back, so you didn't have anything to worry about. Yeah, and then he took the whole <laughs> pulpit and treated it like a machine gun. Bah, 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 bah. Well, we, we got a clip that you were talking about your homo homiletics and exegesis and yeah. things like that. And just let you talk about it. All right, here we go. <laughs> Bless God. So you think of all the theologians out there, you know, theologian, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they talk about their hermeneutics and they talk about their exegitis. Sounds like a bunch of diseases, hermeneutics and exegitis. Sound, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't even believe in vaccines, but I want one after hearing that junk. <laughs> 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 Dude, I love that. I have listened to that a thousand times. <laughs> That is was, so funny. What was the context of your sermon when that got thrown in there? Do you uh, remember? We were, we were the, the, I was preaching about, you know where it talks in, uh, is it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 15 about the gospel? And it, you're saved by this unless you believe in vain. So I was talking about what it means to believe in vain, you know, uh, because it's sort of a passing mention, but it's like, what exactly are the different ways that you can believe in the historical facts of the gospel, but not have a saving faith? And I did an intro with a word study on the meaning of the word vain. And one of the meanings was just empty, 
uh, and I and I was talking about vanity and and anytime you deal with the general public, I know I know a lot of these young Bible college seminary students, young preacher boys imitate who don't know how to preach because they imitate their their lecturer. They'll go off and they'll start talking in these big four, five, six syllable words. Look, I know what they mean, but it sounds so ridiculous. I mean, the word hermeneutic and exegesis, it's like they do. They sound like diseases. How is the general public going to react to you talking like that to them? It's like Apostle Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 2. He was in Athens talking to all these puffed up, uh, pompous jackasses, you know, who <laughs> think themselves to be wise, reveal themselves to be fools. And I mean, are you really glorifying God? Or are you glorifying yourself by using these big terms? And it just got under my crawl where James White said that independent fundamental Baptists do not engage in the public square and that we couldn't engage in the public square. Look, this man spent... He, it's weird. He operates in a realm of his own where the reason he has such a heretical view of uh, textual criticism and, de and the most highest blasphemous form of determinism is because he operates in a world of modernists and unbelievers but tries to hold on to orthodoxy. So he ends up accepting all of their presuppositions and it forces him to basically believe weird things. Like we go out there and we, we talk to people. Jesus said, if he's lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. He right. was lifted up. So he does draw all men unto him at some point in their lives. And we go out and, and if God's drawn somebody at that moment, we we give the gospel to them. If not, you know, we plant seeds and hope God draws them later and somebody else can water it. But that yeah. being said, it, you, there's no possible way that you can communicate with and reach normal people by going up and talking to them about the hermeneutic of the Romans road or, hey, would you mind if I give you my exegesis of the book of Romans? No. Hey, uh, do you have a few minutes that I can show you what the Bible says about how you can know 100% for sure that if you were to meet God today that you would go to heaven? I mean, it's just common sense. It's vanity to talk like that. And Apostle Paul could have talked that way when he went to Corinth, but he's like, why? Uh, it, it, it doesn't profit. I mean, I want to I wanna glorify God, not myself, and just keep it where everybody can get it. I gave you milk because you weren't ready for meat. Yeah. <laughs> no, nobody came in. Everything okay, Brian? I was watching Brian. He keeps taking yeah, the headphones off. Yeah, there's, there's noise around here. It's, it's a little weird. But anyway, was it a 57 mag? Was it a 9 millimeter? <laughs> was it a 45? Or was it a 12 gauge? Um, <laughs> I don't know, but he shot it so many times, I think I got the serial number. <laughs> you, Sounds more cops? like a nine. Yeah. Did you call if, the cops? If it was point six two by thirty nine. Uh, I'm sure you'd have the damage to know it. Let me ask you this: Can y'all give me one second just to call? Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. By the way, yeah. I called. The, I called the police department. They said they've already received multiple calls. So. Oh okay. really? It's straight up legit. Whatever it is it is going on. That's mm. not good. Okay, three. so I'm I'm gonna yeah three, two. Nathan, I hear what you're saying, man. I'm a personally I'm a theology nerd and love talking theology. What Nathan's trying to say is he loves to pontificate on an esoteric theory to the point that nobody has a clue what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Something right. like I, that. I mispronounce these things on purpose. Like yeah, uh, but <laughs> but I, like I, I get what. Union. I mean, <laughs> just just say the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but I get what you're saying when you're talking to people. There's a point where you, you're trying to make yourself sound smarter and you care less about sharing the gospel. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and in power so that your faith 
might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So I, I agree with you 100% on that. But I do believe that theology underlies what we, what we share with people. But uh, the job of a pastor, the job of a teacher, the do- job of a soul winner is to take these high lofty ideas and right. talk about them and talk about scripture in a way that the common man can understand them. So, yeah, I'm, right. I'm with you 100% on that. Right. And that's something in independent fundamental Baptist circles where I'd love to see us get back to this because that was really what brought the independent fundamental Baptist movement to the dance was, you know, a great Bible. I don't want to use the word expositors, but great Bible preachers who just dove into the text and got everything out of it, like John R. Rice, Oliver B. Green, Harold Seitler. And I know there's still people doing that at the local level, uh, but it's, it, it is something I think we should certainly strive for because th- there's, there's so much lamentation about the so-called Laodicean church age. It's like, look, if we're, the circumstances going on right now are the same exact conditions as the circumstances going on when J. Frank Norris was put out of the Southern Baptist Convention in the 1920s, even down to the Depression thing. Instead of focus on, on just idolizing the men of old and lamenting that things aren't like they used to be, because things aren't going to be like they used to be, we're probably going to have a lot. We could have a lot of small fundamental churches. We're not going to have the big pile-sized churches anymore. But that being said, you know, just focus on preaching the Bible, focus on winning souls. And I mean, even J.D. Greer, the president of the convention, has said evolution versus creationism is a, is a tertiary, third-tier issue now. I mean, we're literally right back to where it was in the 1920s. And the IFB is prepared to walk through that door. And and I think we're in a good position to do it. I think a lot, and because we're independent, it's not a movement, we're independent. So some of us will walk through that door, but it's like, if we don't do it, uh, to some extent, you know, like y'all are a part of the split within the independent fundamental Baptist movement that came after the death of John R. Rice that went off sort of into the independent community Bible church movement. And uh, we can talk about that because somebody's going to walk through that door and be the opposition. And that's, that's all I got to say about that. Go go ahead. So my confusion is, um, you know, when I hear you say that the independent Baptists are prepared or ready to walk through that door, um, apparently, you know, you and I view fundamentalist preaching completely different because, you know, I was brought up on that my whole life, heard Mm -hmm. so much of it that, I mean, there'd be no way for me to even describe how many hours and hours and hours of preaching I heard while growing up. But I've heard you already, you know, reference like the name Hiles, maybe at least five times. My question is, how can you have a favorable view of fundamentalism when you, when you realize what we now call modern fundamentalism was a movement greatly, um, I guess, greatly fueled by the man, Jack Kyle's. How, how do you, how do you mention his name like that, knowing all of the things that have now been revealed about who he was and even about those in his inner circle, whether we want to talk about, you know, his own issues with, with other women, with power, with the way he would cause a crowd to, you know, just basically be moved to a frenzy. Um, and then, you know, Dave, his son, and then his own daughter coming out and giving testimony to what real life was like. It really confuses me, Nathan, because, you know, there's a part of you, you're a really articulate guy. And and JC's already said, you know, you're very likable. I just have issue with how, how do you draw from names like that? How do you draw from a movement like that and see the man centeredness and and the lack of of what i would call true biblical exposition how how do you draw from that movement and say i'm going to reference this name and by the way i believe this is the movement to step through that door jack hiles and curtis hudson were great biblical expositors 
Now, Jack Hiles was a man who really got into topical preaching. So he, he would dive into do it one topic at a time, but he definitely was a great Bible teacher on doctrine. He believed in soul winning. And I want to stress this because, first off, my Bible says that an accusation against an elder, which is synonymous with a pastor, is to be established between two or three witnesses. And you can like this or you can lump this, but in, crim in criminal court, uh, the, seemingly the only, the only time perjury is not prosecuted is in divorce court. And in, the, in, in First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, had set aside $35,000 in a savings account to collect interest to go into their secretary's uh, retirement account. And so whenever uh, her husband in a divorce realized that he could get a payday, he goes, oh, I have an idea. I, I, can, I can say all these things and, and it, it'll, it, that they have no way of disproving it. That's why everybody's after pastors. It's like, look at you learn this from like even Roy Moore up in Alabama when he was running for the Senate. One of those women who made those wild accusations against him accused pastors in Gadsden, Alabama, three separate pastors in Gadsden, Alabama, the same thing. I do, I do believe, I, let me say this, Nathan, I do believe that happens sometimes where people are falsely accused, but let's, let's move on beyond uh, Hiles being accused of having an affair for years and years with the secretary and breaking up her marriage. What about Jack Hiles' son? What about the things that Howells obviously covered over with the sexual abuse and hiding it and sending him to another church, covering it up, the suits that are coming out now? I mean, are you just saying that all of those are fabricated? The answer to that would be, I don't know. Now, remember, Jack Hiles, well, J. Frank Norris pastored mega churches, so I can't say Jack Hiles was the first mega church pastor, but... He really innovated the, the church model where you have all different kinds of programs for all different walks of life, age groups, et cetera, et cetera. There was nothing, there was nothing in place to see what could go wrong in that kind of church model. There was but there's no way, there's no way to justify your son sexually molesting a teenage girl in the youth group and to pay off her dad to keep it quiet and to send your son four states away to cover it up. And that's and documented. Way, His own our, family members. Did he really know that? And also just remember though, in the case of the daughter, I'll, I'll address the issue of the daughter because the daughter's made a pretty good living for herself uh, going out there acting like she survived a cult. And we see this all the time. You see this on with the Twitter trolls. Basically, every time somebody gets under conviction and has their feelings hurt, every time somebody loves their sin more than they love God, uh, they, they wind up going out of the church. They wind up, they wind up acting like that they were the victims of all these horrible assaults of their emotions and their feelings, their trigger, their snowflakes, spiritual PTSD, they call it. And then they spend their lives projecting their imaginary emotional baggage onto men of God that they've never even met, okay? And just to go further than that, uh, these people look for any, any, any accusation. It's like, you know, look, Altoona, Pennsylvania was able to identify, I think, over 10,000 Catholic priests who had molested children in just that general area. Whereas the Houston Chronicle, I think was able to identify six independent fundamental Baptist pastors who there was like any there there where there was substantiating evidence, okay? This was should, these, should these pastors be held accountable when, when legitimate accusations are brought forward? I know yes, people that have been abused and molested. And I believe, and the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, that no nation has ever had such a perfect law as God's law. You know, whenever they go, these people who are accused of this, if these accusations meet the criteria to go before a fair trial, and when there is a fair conviction, I'm going to go further than what the, the, the liberal Supreme Court and what the U.S. Constitution says. Mandatory execution for, for pedophiles. 
public executions. I mean, you didn't have these problems when you had public hangings and everybody could dress all up in their hanging clothes and go, hey, son, oh, boy. you see what happens when you do stuff like that? <laughs> Look, if someone is caught red-handed in the act of molesting a child, they should die. Okay, so we knew, we knew the son personally. When, when the briefcase is dropped in the trash can at an airport, a member of the church sees it, thinks it's done accidentally. He retrieves the briefcase only to find all of the pictures and all of the despicable proof. And then your recommendation is to send him to another church states away. Um, you know, I, I the timeline, well, I thought the timeline was that there was some questionable accusations when he was in Indiana and then you know, sort of, there wasn't really proof, but then it was after he was in Texas was when the, was when the briefcase was actually exposed. And then he was put out of the ministry after that. that see, I but, thought that was the timeline. Well, see, my point would be this. If the foundation is broken, then the house is going to be broken. And, and, you know, for example, we, we can, we can debate what house did, whether or not he did anything. I can say this, it's known that there was a door at the end of a hallway. He and his secretary had a shared office behind a locked door. Um, you know, the, the Bible says avoid the appearance of evil. So I think we can at least say that was an incredibly unwise decision. I and agree there, with you. And, and, were, and that's the thing. And my takeaway from the Hiles thing is this, is that... I don't believe that he had any way of knowing all the things that could go wrong from infiltrators, pet, uh, infiltrators who are either pedophiles or position seekers or false prophets uh, or, or scam artists uh, infiltrating. I don't think it was so uncharted that I don't think he was ready for all that. And my view is this, I mean, he was a saved man. He had a bit, he had an orthodox uh, confession of faith. He was greatly used of God. The vast majority, well, all of his fruit was good, I believe. There were some infiltrators that had bad fruit, but I mean, that was happening with the apostles. Their churches had infiltrators with bad fruit. So well, if, my, my takeaway would just be this. I think that we can learn a lot from what went wrong in that church model and we we can make precautions accordingly. And see, you and I, where we would differ on this greatly is I don't think anything went wrong. I think the man was wrong. The source was wrong. And my question is, how can you listen to him abuse scripture in this sermon who who slayed these? And then, of course, he goes through this ridiculous list I mean, that is such an abuse of scripture. How, yes. how do we call him? How do we call him an expositor? How do we ever say he was an expositor? So let me ask you this. Who do you, who do you think some great preachers are? Like, like if Nathan Rager was going to have a top five, who would make the top five? Curtis Hudson, I would say is the prince of preachers. Okay. Uh, I don't, I, I just think Curtis Hudson was the gold standard. He was so articulate. He was so eloquent. He was an unlearned man who trusted in God to learn his stuff. Uh, so Curtis Hudson's definitely one of them. Uh, I would certainly uh, put on that list Jack Hiles. And uh, I would say Phil Kidd, man, I've never been convicted of my sin like when I was listening to Phil Kidd. I mean, man, he, he, he's got the power of God on him. Uh, I, like, I like Tony Hudson's preaching, and I, I wish I could hear more of his stuff that he preaches at his church verse by verse. But, I, you know, he's a really good conference speaker, and there's a time and a place for that. And, you know, John Hamblin, I view him in the same way. I, I love his stuff. We are 1,000% bipolar opposites. <laughs> and I, like, you just yes. named my bottom five. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm concerned about that because 
you know, you've got Phil Kidd calling women fat, whores. I mean, the th- he called me a faggot from the pulpit. Yeah, the, <laughs> Were the you things- there? Hundred percent, dude. Well, what did you do? Turned around. He, well, he walked. Gotta, he walked in I the walked service. In. Walked into the service. Told, I took a guy who was an independent fundamental Baptist that told a girl to leave youth groups because she was pregnant. Said this is not a place for you. And I said, no, no, no. She's welcome here. We walked into the service. I, I on purposely said wear jeans, shorts, flip flops, t-shirt, whatever. We went down. Both of us walked in, shorts, T-shirt, flip-flops. He felt so uncomfortable, and we heard him stand up there and preach how he preached a whore right out of church because she was in the house of God in a pair of pants, and that whore is going to hell. And I said, do you understand why I brought you here tonight? He said, I do. My blood was boiling. We stood up to leave, and he said, looks like I'm preaching two fags out of the service right now. And I wheeled around. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. This isn't preaching. I said, this fag and that fag, we're out of here, man. We jumped in the truck and we left. We got down the road. He said, oh, no, I forgot my keys. I left them on the pew. He ran in there, dude, and come running out. I've never seen that big boy run so fast. But that, that's where I have a problem because that guy called me that from the pulpit. And so – What year was this? Oh, man, 2003, 2004. Fa- Faith Bible camp. In Resaca, Georgia. S- Sammy uh, Allen's camp. I want to interject something. I met him for the first time in June 2019. Uh, one of the nicest, most humble, kindest, most helpful men I've ever met in my life. I don't know exactly what he may have heard on the other side of that, this or that, but I will say this. He, he has really been used of God to build a church that brings in whores Uh, people who had murdered their children in abortion clinics, drug addicts, and he's preached the devil out of them. God's done great works in their life. And he, and he's a very, maybe he's changed. I I would suggest listening to more of his recent preaching. Thank you. (laughs) Okay. The the things I've heard, the things I've heard from him years ago, the racist comments that I've heard some horrible things come out of his mouth I would I would never listen to him again but I have heard that in recent years he's toned it down a lot but I would just say that if he has toned it down he's falling into the category of compromiser that he would call everybody else if he's toning it down and if he hasn't toned it down then he's he's way out of bounds but I understand well, still you. Pre- he still preaches against whores and faggots and to be fair uh I'm going to get a little biblical for a minute here. Uh, The word harlot and the word whore are biblical terms. And also, uh, you hear the word faggot and queer. Uh, If you'll turn your Bible to the book of Jude, in verse 7, it refers to uh, the false prophets who are given over to strange flesh. The word strange, a synonym of the word strange is queer. And also, it talks about that these people like Sodom and Gomorrah, that they have their destruction, that that he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah as an example for people like them. And the word faggot is a British term referring to a bundle of sticks to be burned. And so if you look at Jude verse 7, the word faggot and queer are actually biblical concepts. I mean, I don't say it from my pulpit, because I just stick to the word sodomite because it's something people understand. But I will defend another Bible preacher if they use those words because they are biblical concepts. So you just contradicted what you were talking about a minute ago where you don't use big words because it's going to turn people away or help them not know what the gospel says because we're pontificating on esoteric theories. But the word faggot and queer and calling them a sodomite, when you're using that language, they want nothing to do with you. They want nothing to do with Tampa Independent Baptist Church because of that language so how do you balance the two between not saying big words that are going to confuse them like Trinity just say Trinity but yet you're calling them something that is very culturally very unacceptable okay so here let me let me explain I use the word sodomite because that's the biblical term the Bible calls them sodomites so I call them sodomites okay I do not use the word faggots and queers in my pulpit because it's not a biblical term i'll defend another pastor for using those terms because it's a biblical concept i mean just because something is permissible doesn't mean it's profitable so i personally don't do it now but at the same time 
I, I will I will say this. It's I, I do think it how can I put this? There's we need to keep preaching against this stuff. Now let me ask, if, you, let me ask you a question. Do you sure. do you believe that God can save a homosexual? Okay, so if you look at the if you look at the flow of the text in Romans one, uh, there is a point where they pass the point of no return. Look, I mean, somebody is, being a sodomite is unnatural. Okay, uh, and they're given over to that because they knew the truth of God, which is meaning that God was drawing them. They knew the truth and they were under conviction, and so. Uh, they it, it, it some and and so they turned the truth of God into a lie, and then God and then God gave them over to their vile affections. So it just started getting worse and worse, and then God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Reprobate is is past the point of no return. They cannot be saved past that point. Now, there are people who because of chemical attacks with estrogenics and the foods and the drinks there are people who because of media propaganda or bullying or child abuse or molestation who would be very confused and would deal with those temptations out of confusion and they're not actually reprobates but there comes a point where if you hate god and hatefully reject god god's just gonna wash his hands of you and you, like you know what you're gonna have the, that sensor that regulator removed from you and then after that you're gonna be one of those sodomites who goes out and has over a hundred partners every year and just several pounds of dung every year walks around uh, naked in front of children kissing children and it says the sodomites are given over to all unrighteousness you, you want to know what that plus in LGBTQ plus stands for, it stands for pedophile because that's ultimately where it's going to end up. They wanted civil unions weren't enough. So they wanted marriage. They got it. Then they got the trans agenda, you know, so now they're moving on to pedophilia. Even mainstream magazines are advocating for pedophilia. Now look at Europe. They've lowered the age of consent so they can have, they can molest children in Europe. It's straight out of hell. Let me, let me quote a verse to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to quote it out of the King James because I, I know, know that's, what, that's what you prefer. Man. It says, know, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Mm -hmm. But... But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So you've got a list of sins there, which, by the way, from fornicators, which is heterosexual, which are fornicating, sleeping with multiple partners, which is our entire culture, which was me before I came to Christ, all the way to uh, idolaters, to uh, it, it does include homosexuality. But then it, the very next one is thieves covetous drunkards how do you put homosexuality at like being this ultimate sin that god can never forgive which obviously he does forgive it because it's they were listed the in this mm -hmm. okay so first off homosexuality is not the ultimate sin that god can't forgive it's a symptom of committing the ultimate sin that God will not forgive. Now that I've just said, I've just I've just never heard a, an independent fundamental Baptist preacher talk about fornicators in the same way that they talk about homosexuals. I've never talk, heard them talk about thieves in the same way that they talk about homosexuals. I've never heard anybody gluttons. say that any uh, yeah gluttons anybody that says any other person on this list drunkards that they are given over to a reprobate mind and cannot be forgiven. But this is a category that has been intentionally created by the independent fundamental Baptist movement to put them beyond God's grace. And I believe that's, that's heresy. And let's be honest, the, the, the whores that they're talking about to add into this, the whores that they're talking about from the pulpit are whores because they're wearing pants. It's not because they're in the act of sex or fornication. It's because of the, 
the status that they have put out there where the, you know, you've got to be in a dress or culottes. And so these ladies are being called whores because they are wearing pants. I'll, I'll address that issue. We, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and come back to the woman in pants issue because I might, I might knock your socks off on that. So let's deal with the socks. Can't wait. First. Can't wait. <laughs> right. So, okay. So first off, now the issue of first Corinthians six, nine, if you look at the context, it's talking about how uh, even the least among the brethren, the most, the most non-account Christian is more qualified to judge a matter than the the secular pagans in the in the outside community, and also it says so too were some of you. It doesn't mean that all y'all were given over to those things uh, like the whole world is. The next thing is that term abusers of yourselves with mankind. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in on that by first getting into the word effeminate. I've heard the explanation, and some of the modern perversions get off into this, and to say that oh well, it's referring to a sodomite and a catamite. Which, which one was querying on top and which one was querying on the bottom. And God is, God's not a pervert. He's not going to – my Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words and that he's going to preserve them forever, okay? That's Psalm 12, and uh, that's a King James only favorite. But anyway, uh, so, <laughs> so – okay, so he's not going to give a graphic, pornographic description of querying, okay? He's just – not going to do that. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I really hate to go back to the Greek here, but I will go ahead and do it because the people who always want to go back to the Greek don't like to go back to the Greek here because the word is, it's a, it's a compound word, man, bed. And the combination of those two terms appear nowhere else in Greek literature. It's used by Apostle Paul twice one in one of his letters to Timothy, and then the other one was there. And, I mean, it could have multiple meanings. It could refer to, you know, if it could, you know, if a, uh, it could refer to a male prostitute. It could refer to a nymphomaniac. Uh, it could refer to a, a, a male harlot. It could refer to a sex addict. It could refer to someone who cohabitates. It could refer to a swinger. It could refer to all kinds of perverted, disgusting things. So uh, my, uh, okay, so I, I'm not a hype. I'm not an ultra dispensationalist. Okay. I believe in interpreting the Bible by what it, what's not clear by what's clearly stated. We can't always understand everything, but we can know what it doesn't mean by judging what is clear. And I'm not going to just dispensationalize away what I don't understand. And what we see here is clear scripture tells us that these most depraved sodomites that are given over to a reprobate mind are past the point of no return. So what could these things mean? We don't know exactly what the term means, but we do we have something to work off of there. So so here's my question then. Uh, Romans chapter one, and, and this, is, this is more approaching how this subject is dealt with. And we started down this, this pig path, you know, talking about what I consider crass language from the pulpit. But in Romans chapter one, typically the sin you hear called out, of course, is same-sex relationships. So in Romans chapter one, that's typically what, what you hear. And Romans chapter one is a favorite. Mm -hmm. And of course the, of course the chapter ends with, they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faultless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And so it goes on with this, this incredible list of, of very dark, behaviors. The thing that really takes me, um, I guess, back is you never hear anyone address Romans chapter two, because, you know, when the Bible was written, there weren't chapters and verses, right? So this would have been one continual letter. So the word chapter two begins with the word, therefore, anytime you see the word, therefore, you need to know what the word, therefore is there for. So right. you have to look back. 
So in light of that list that of people and, and horrible sinful behaviors that were listed in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2 says, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. The thing that really concerns me in the way this is addressed is not calling sin, sin, but it's, it's preached in such a judgmental, condescending way. Do we believe that God is capable of being God? I think that, for me, is the heart of the issue. Do we believe that God is capable? Because here's the thing. God names everything that exists in Romans chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, he says, you be you and let me be God. And when you try to play my role, when you try to do my job for me, then you're guilty. And so what I grew up hearing and what I still hear, by the way, um, Phil Kidd hasn't toned it down. In recent sermons, his language is just as crass as it's ever been. The way I heard these sermons delivered was in a very condescending, judgmental, um, really angry way. And here's the thing. You know, gossips is mentioned in that list. Why do we make them deacons and choir members? And yet we're going to call out, you know, this, this other group in this particular, uh, indu uh, who are indulging in this particular sin. Uh, I just have serious issue with the way it's presented. That's, that's my case. And I, well, think, I think, we, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was just going to say, I think we could talk about this all day. We've spent quite a bit of time on it. I was wanting to ask you, Nathan, about a couple of the things I, I shared on a previous episode, some of the reasons why I'm not a fundamentalist. And I still, I want to clarify, I still believe the fundamentals of the faith, which, you know, the five fundamentals that sparked we the whole do. fundamentalist movement. We all do. We all affirm those. We all actually affirm a whole lot more than that because those are really a very small uh, sliver of what Christians believe, even Orthodox uh, Christians. But I just want to throw some of these things out there. I've basically boiled all of the reasons why I'm not a fundamentalist down and why I walked away from the IFB movement to three things, and I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to a few of these. Uh, number one, the reason I'm not a fundamentalist is because of focus. I believe that the fundamentalist movement is by large not gospel-centered. They are more about preaching opinions, standards, preferences, and performance. So could you speak into that? It is the fundamentalism that you see and that you want to be focused on the gospel, or is it more focused on outward appearance and man-made standards? Okay, so first off, uh, application. So if, if preaching without applications is the preaching of a dead gospel. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when we go out soul winning, we run into people all the time who, who – go to these liberal non-denom churches that just that just preach the gospel you know i i like to say churches who only preach first principle don't even do that right because that we think they think that they are saved because they're good people who repented of their sins but they never actually hear real preaching against sin uh they or they don't know if they're going to heaven because they, 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 oh, well, that's God's decision based off of my works. I mean, we run into these people all the time, okay? I, I'll, stand, I'll stand on this pulpit, if, well, if it would hold me. Uh, by the way, <laughs> my, 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 my 100-pound wife eats like three times as much as I do. So the glutton thing is a bad argument against fundamentalists, okay? Uh, <laughs> now that we got that out of the way. But you've so, got you to gotta admit that there are a whole lot of independent fundamental Baptist pastors that preach against homosexuality, but you can find them at the buffet line with grease dripping off their beard when they're devouring 15 pounds of fried chicken after they preach on Sunday. That, that, is, a legitimate, that wait, is a legitimate wait. charge. 
Tony Hudson has a post where he's talking about Lester Roloff didn't live one day longer drinking his carrot juice than I do eating a steak and bacon <laughs> and drinking my coffee as stout as can be and proud of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he, he works on he works on a farm though. He's a hard working man. So I mean let's put that in context. But, I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So anyway, but that being said though, uh, we were talking about that about that. I mean, there okay, so we have to rightly divide. Okay, so salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, okay? But not every believer is going to be a disciple because so many of these people who believed didn't really come back to get involved, and not every tree is going to bear fruit. But that being said, so, okay, so I'm not going to teach moral law to someone who's not saved and is not sealed by the Holy Ghost because they don't, they can't understand it because it's spiritually discerned. Okay, so, and, I'll, and I'm not going to teach the deep mysteries to someone who does, to a baby Christian who doesn't understand the moral law. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to rightly divide the difference between moral law and ritual law because Jesus said that he didn't come to do away with the law but to fulfill it. These old ritual laws were a foretelling of Jesus' first coming and, of course, his second coming to come. Now, the moral laws were not done away with because, as we see, that lust is now, because lust is now the the sin of adultery, that now supporting the sodomite agenda, as it says in Romans 132, uh, even though it's even though it's not a legal thing, and Christians can't execute people like the priests of the Old Testament did, Romans one thirty two says that they are deserving of that the allies are deserving of death, just like the people who do these things. Uh, there, there, there's uh, the the sin of hating your brother is the same as the sin of murder in the in the Old Testament. Now. We, we don't have the enforcement measures like they did in the Old Testament, but you have to rightly divide the difference between ritual law and moral law. And so many people get off on the IFB preachers about talking about the, the women in dresses. Okay, so I'm going to address that. It is an abomination for a man to wear that which pertaineth to a woman and a woman to wear that which pertaineth to a man. Everybody may have a different interpretation of that, but that's Bible. You can't knock somebody for believing it and trying to find a way to be biblically faithful in that. Now, uh, hey, now, like, speaking of speaking it? of that, speaking of that, you know, in the Middle East, men wore robes at that time. Why? Why are you not wearing a robe? Well, when they, you were, preach? they were. Jesus robes didn't wear pants. Riches. They wore robes with britches, and and that's the thing. It's all going to differ. Chapter and verse. Uh, it, ta- it, it, it describes the priest of the garments. I'm sorry, the garments of the priest. Uh, so anyway, but that being said, now the, the, the attire will change between cultures. I mean, Apostle Paul even talked about this, about being all things to all men that he might save some. I mean, that doesn't okay, so, make so if So if the American culture, it's acceptable for women to wear pants, then why are we going to go back to an Old Testament Levitical law that was specifically written to Jews, and it also says that it's an abomination for men to wear. Uh, what was it, Brian? Mixed Garments, fabrics. Mixed fabrics. Okay, like you so, have mixed fabrics on right now, but you've never preached on that verse. But you'll preach okay. on a, women wearing so, pants. Off, I don't. Pr- I really would like to stand up at the pulpit and preach bridges for men. Pant- uh, Bridges for men, pants for women. I don't have a chapter and verse. I'm sorry, but there are things I do have chapters and verses on. Isaiah forty, Isaiah forty-seven one through three defines nakedness as having your thigh exposed. So you need to cover your thigh. Uh, and also, just to go further than that, uh, it's not just cover it with the attire of a harlot, which is form-fitting jeans because you're still revealing the form of the thigh. If you have holes in them, you're still revealing the thigh. You're supposed to adorn yourselves in modesty. And that's, that, that is Bible. I do have Bible for that. And also the mixed fabric thing is really easy to understand because if you put something through a washing machine that are things, it says that the mixed fabrics are woven together. 
If I wear a silk tie with a cotton shirt, that's not a mixed, that's not a mixed garment because it's not woven together. But the thing is, these different materials age differently. These different, these different materials. Okay, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask Common you this. Sense. Let me ask you this. How do you handle a bird nest? How do I handle a bird nest? Is that uh, important for Christians today in America? Uh, it, it depends. No, no, no. Listen, because the exact same chapter, the exact mm -hmm. same chapter you're talking about in Deuteronomy talks about how to handle a bird nest, but no IFB guys are preaching on that. It also because it's the of their beards. Yeah, well, it's written to the Jews. It, it's a different context. It's a different age. It's 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 hilarious to me that people are preaching things okay, out of a chapter and bird. leaving things, leaving other things out. I mean, it's are we really Bible believing if, okay, if we're so not preaching part so of it? How to handle a bird nest is going to change with different technology and such. But the, the, the principles of moral law are going to stay the same. Uh, a man should, uh, God created men and he created women. There are, two, there are only two genders and you should be able to tell. Like uh, Paul told the Corinthians that nature itself testifies that it's a shame unto a man uh, to have long hair or for a woman to have short hair. I mean, we don't need some woman walking around like cue ball, Demi Moore, something like that. We don't need that. God tells us what nature testifies. It doesn't say culture. It says nature. Now, things will differ between cultures. It's like, you know, my Bible says, he who hath no sword, let him sell his cloak and, and buy one. And then when they had, and then when, uh, so look, uh, your, your daggers and your swords are outdated weapons technology. So you need to have a gun now. It, because a sword is an outdated weapons technology. Now, but also I want to point out something that, that, that's going to give you goosebumps. Jesus said that two is enough. So that means that, when, that if you have one gun, that's not enough. But he doesn't say three guns are too many. So Jesus wants you to have more, at least two guns. <laughs> All right, man. That'll preach, especially in an IFB church. <laughs> Hi, man. <laughs> okay, so so I said the first reason we and I said I, but this I didn't come up with these on my own. This is us. We uh, sure. we come up with these reasons why we are not fundamentalists. One was focus, and I don't think you really answered, gave me a good answer to that. Although you talked for a really long time, but <laughs> I, I believe that the focus of independent Baptist churches is more about standards and performance than it is about the gospel. But I'll move on to number two. There's a big lack of love in what I saw in the independent fundamental Baptist world, meaning that Jesus said the defining mark of my disciples is their love for one another. Yeah. I've seen more fighting in independent fundamental Baptist church between fundamental Baptist camps that are against each other, preaching against each other, splits in independent fundamental Baptist churches, and the lack of love between disciples testifies, or people that claim to be disciples, testifies to the fact that they're missing something. And when the pastor, the leader is standing in the pulpit, yelling and screaming and blood veins popping out of his forehead, angry at everybody else's sin, but never talks about his own sin, there's a big lack of love. And I've got an issue with that. And that's why I'm not still sitting on an independent Baptist pew. Well, is that, a, is that, a, is that a fair accusation that there's a big lack of love in the independent fundamental Baptist movement? Uh, I think that's a fair assessment, and that's probably something that we have to really be on guard for. Now, with do the you want to change that? Look, like, do you feel like there could be reform in that area that you could like? Because you you sense that, and so since you sense that, I mean, we we all know that's real. Us three really believe that's real, and you sense that. Do you, is that a desire? to keep going down that because that's the way we've always done it. That's the old time religion. That's the old path. And I want to stay with that. Or, or do you feel a desire to bring change to that? It's, it's a, that's a difficult proposition because you don't want to fall away into ecumenism. Uh, and also, and there are some things where you really need to take a stand on doctrine. I mean, if you think that the plan of salvation changes in the tribulation, from faith alone to you're saved by supporting Israel. That's damn, that, that's not 
her, not all heresy is damnable heresy. It's I like to say, you know, uh, a woman I don't can, see what that what. How does that have anything to do with a lack of love? I mean, that's that's you're well, you're that's, avoiding the question. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. I, I was just getting, I was trying to show examples of things that are worth fighting over. <laughs> okay. I, I, I see what you're saying about that. It, it, it's a difficult proposition because I mean, there are some things that are worth fighting for. Now, well, let me that, ask you this. Let me ask you this. You're, you're preaching a sermon and a homosexual walks in and sits in the chair in your church. First of all, are you going to kick them out? I mean, they're yeah. obvious homosexuals. You're going to kick them out. You're not going to yeah, tell absolutely. them about you're not going to tell them about the love of Jesus that can set them free from their sin? Because if they don't hear it from you, where are they going to hear it? Yeah, we I have, mean... We have children here. That, no. Well, they're not... I've had homosexuals come to my church. They came to watch their, their brother get baptized, who became a Christian, and he's praying for, for his homosexual sister, and she brought her partner to church, and we had the opportunity to preach the gospel that, yes, sin is sin, but Jesus loves sinners, and he came to die for sinners, and he came to set heterosexuals free from their sin. He came to set homosexuals free from their sin, and you can find freedom in Christ. Would you not preach the gospel to anyone? So, so Nathan, before you answer that, Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. Chief among sinners. He really so here, was. He so, thought he was. Um, I'm not sure. I think breathing out threatenings and cursings and leading um, rallies the genocide to martyr, against Christians. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit worse uh, than I think that's pretty on. serious. But so yeah. here, here's my question, though. If, if the gospel was given to the chief of sinners from Jesus, how can we withhold the gospel from any of those who would definitely be beneath or below the chief in their level of sin. Well, okay. So first off, to put things in context, uh, Paul, Paul did those things in ignorance. He was not a reprobate. Uh, he did those things in ignorance. It, 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 was his, it was a combination of zeal and ignorance. Second off, I do believe he was speaking from a position of humility and, uh, and, and a position of repentance that comes from spiritual growth. Uh, because I'm really, I'm really weary of that term repentance because people don't know how to rightly divide that term and get off into works-based salvation. But that being said, uh, so in the case of Apostle Paul, though, you have to keep in mind who was living at his time. Nero was living at his time. Nero was far worse than Apostle Paul. So we know that wasn't a literal statement. But then again, the difference is Nero was a reprobate uh, who was doing those things because, doing those things knowingly evil because he had already bit, give, bit gone past the point of no return, I believe. Whereas in the case of Apostle Paul, he was doing those things out of ignorance. And again, th this is something I want to stress here. There's a difference. Okay, so church is a called out assembly. Inside the church is for discipling saved people. Soul winning is for outside the church. If you try to confuse those things, you're going to mess people up spiritually and intellectually. Uh, but so, you, but that, so do you go to a gay pride parade and soul win? When I go out into the community, if I see like one of those equal rights decals or rainbow thing, I'll still knock on the door because I don't know if they're an ally. I don't know if there's a child in there being hurt by the reprobates. I don't know if it's someone who's just extremely confused and they're not at that point where I think it's verse 25, where it turns into verse 26 in Romans 1. I don't know if they're at that point yet. Uh, so it's sort of one of those issues where I can't really say. Let me, let then, me ask yeah. you a question. Let me ask you a question this way, Nathan. If, if you work with a guy at the hotel, and this guy is a young college guy, he's a heterosexual, he's not a Christian, wasn't raised in a Christian home, doesn't believe in Jesus. Y'all have some conversations about theology and different things, and you get to share the gospel with him. And you come to find out that this dude is on Tinder, and he's swiping left, swiping right. He slept with 27 girls this month because people are literally doing that now. Like it's a hookup app. 
he's on Tinder. He's heterosexual. He slept with 20 girls this month, 20 different girls this month. Would you invite him to church to come hear the gospel? I would give him the gospel at work. If he came to your church, would you kick him out because you're concerned that he's going to do something to one of these kids in your church? Or is that a special category for homosexuals? Mm. There's no difference in sexual sin. It's just as egregious there, against God. There is a difference because it's natural affection versus unnatural affection. Uh, natural song, affection for 30 different women? That's not natural. That's, natural. That's, that's an abomination against God created man, one man for one woman for one lifetime. Well, and when we go outside of marriage and we have multiple affairs, multiple before marriage, fornication, pornea, that, that you know, if we can even take it back to guys who are watching porn all the time. No one's right. going to go meet people at the back door of the church and say, hey, bro, you're not coming to Independent Baptist Church if you've watched porn this, this week. Okay, so first off, I want to zero in on something. Uh, there's, there's a difference between a natural desire and an unnatural desire. And sodomy is an unnatural desire. And Is it sin? Now, they're both a, it, fornication and whoremongering or is an abomination, but it's not an unnatural affection, unfortunately, because think of it this way. Uh, okay, we're all married men here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, we, I, get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. but we, we all still struggle with lustful thoughts. I mean, we've all been, we've all been in line at the subway or the Walmarts, and there's some, there's some hoochie mama and daisy dukes and we all and we're and we're having to sit there and and, and stare at bubble gum like an idiot because because we we don't want to look. You would see, you tell her, would you tell her about Jesus? Oh, I would definitely tell her about Jesus. I would tell the whoremonger. Would, about Jesus. would you tell her she's a hoochie mama? <laughs> I was just speaking off the cuff. Come on now. <laughs> I know, but I mean that's that's when we see people we we categorize we categorize people as being worse sinners than we are. And I would have to agree with the Apostle Paul. I'm the chief of sinners. So yeah. I can't look at someone else and say, your sin is worse than mine. Let me fix you. You're a hoochie mama. I'm wearing a suit and a tie, so I'm better than you. And that's what they hear. And, and I'm not going to I'm not gonna get into my whole life story, but let me just point, let me just say this. If I hadn't gotten saved when I was six years old, I would have been a reprobate, okay? I mean, the fact that I was sealed by the Holy Ghost when I was living as a backslider for the world, the fact that I was sealed by the Holy Ghost when I got saved at six years old, you know, having grown up in a Christian home, but rejecting it uh, in, re in, in my young adulthood, I would have been given over to a reprobate mind. Okay, so I want to get that out of the way. And I have a very, I don't expect much out of non-believers because they don't have the Holy Ghost in them. I'm harder on believers than I am unbelievers. Now, as far now again, I want to stress this. I do. I am very weary of the idea of filling a church with non-believers because you, whenever you preach discipleship sermons to non-believers, you can really mess those people up. So, Nathan, if I can just interject very quickly. So, one of the fundamental differences. I had with fundamentalism and one of the premier changes that took place in my heart, you just referred to a building as the church. You said, we're not going to fill a church speaking of brick and mortar up with a bunch of sinners. Yeah. And I would, a, <laughs> the house of God, the house of God. Okay. The church the, the okay. church, but the church auditorium is not the house of God. Peter actually, preached. Actually, if you look at if you look at what Paul told Timothy uh, when he when he told him he wrote the letter uh, to teach him how he should behave in the house of God, that was obviously referring to uh, the building where the church, which is the called out assembly, which is the local New Testament church, meets. That's, that's what he was talking about. The house of God. Okay, so the temple of God is the born-again believer in Christ who the, who the Holy Ghost dwells in. The house of God is the building or the room or, or the, the, even the picnic table where the called-out assembly meets. Uh, the church is the local 
New Testament church of uh, this called out assembly of believers that gathers together. And the body of Christ is all believers everywhere. And the bride of Christ is going, is not going to exist until the marriage supper in the end times. So then, so then going back to what I was saying, when Peter okay. preached, he said that God doesn't dwell in a building made with hands. That's pretty straightforward. And, and I mean, we could get into some, some particulars on the text that you read just, a, or you quoted just a moment ago regarding Paul's words, but you're referring to a building as the church where mm-hmm. the new Testament language would be people. You're right. The assembly is the church believers leave the assembly and they remain the temple or the house of God because God dwells in them. So when we are actively living that out, we're going to have an impact on sinners regardless of our location. And if we're not the light of the world, then sinners have no hope of seeing that light. Um, I'm just, you know, your language about the church building you know, really concerns me because, and I should have said the church auditorium. You know, it's 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 the building where the church meets. Just to be clear, I mean, and and I and I think we're getting into semantical issues here because because you know how is the church auditorium the house of God? It's because the Holy Ghost that lives inside the born again believer uh, in, in the, in the called out assembly, the church that meets in the auditorium, it's the house of God because God's there when these, when two or more gathered, it's not that, it's not that complicated to understand, but it's a lot of semantical that you really have to break it down. It's, it's, it's not complicated if you've actually looked it up and tried to grid it, but I'd have to, I don't know. I'd have to write it down and form a grid right now because I, I did research this myself because me, it's a lot of weird breakdowns. Let me move on to the third reason why we're not fundamentalists. The sure. third reason is because of pride. I think there's a lot of pride in the fundamentalist movement, especially talking about preacher celebrities, the whole idea of us versus them, like believers are better than people in the world no we're just sinners saved by grace we there's this whole idea you've called lost people reprobates over and over and over again and i know that's biblical i know that's biblical language but i also realize that there's this mentality within the ifb world that we're better than them so there this this whole thing about showmanship in the pulpit instead of expository preaching revivalism instead of discipleship, emotionalism, instead of gospel content, separatism, rather than culture engagement, elitism, rather than unity, tradition, rather than biblical truth. These are all things that lead to pride. And I think it's disgusting to sinners when they encounter us and they see it as a cult because we're speaking down against them rather than saying, hey, we're all sinners who need the grace of God. God loves you. God wants to change your life. So specifically, okay, so just to reiterate the question, it's specifically that y'all are not fundamentalists because you believe that uh, fundamentalists view ourselves as superior to lost people. And other Christian people. Okay. Yeah, so. I can't tell you how many sermons I've sat through where you preach against the Pentecostal church down the road and you spent more time talking, not you specifically, but the preacher spent more time talking about the, the Pentecostal group down the road than he did about preaching the gospel, which is well, a problem for me because that's based in pride. It's why I'm better than everybody. We talk about legalism because here's legalism. You set up one tent with independent fundamental Baptist and the tent next to it with church of God and they're going to preach against each other because they're not doing it the exact same way that they teach that it should be done. That's legalism. Well, you know, I grew up hearing, you know, that Southern Baptists were the worst. Mm -hmm. Um, I can remember sermons against Southern Baptists where, you know, to the point that I, you know, I shared it on the podcast in, in tears, you know, that I stood in my grandparents' living room and treated them so wrongly because they were listening to Charles Stanley because they were homebound. And, you know, I just came out Mm -hmm. like a raging bull against them on that. 
Okay, so uh, first off, I'm going to respond to the Charles Stanley thing. Uh, I think Charles Stanley's a good man who does his best to be faithful. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with him being in the convention or, nor using the NASB. And I do think that his compromise on Bible translation, on Bible versions, his compromise with going back into the convention and, and trying to save that which was rotten, uh, has led to the apostasy of his son. Now, that being said, I can't even tell you how many times I've been out soul winning. I've been in the stores talking to people about Jesus. I've been in workplaces where they start talking to me about the Haggy, or they start talking to me about Stanley, or they start talking to me about the Osteen or the, or the Copeland. And I'm surprised that I don't have teeth like a meth head because I don't bite my tongue because I need my tongue, but oh man, it's so hard not to say anything. So I can appreciate what you're saying there. And I think, I think the reason that we get into preaching so hard against other camps is because we don't, we look at just, I use the Charles Stanley example. We look at what happened there. I mean, we look at what happened with, say going back into the convention and and the problems that came with the, the, the churches that I've served that were in the convention that used to be IFB and there were all kinds of problems uh, as far as fellowship that happened there and and also they 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 changed on bible versions and you know what I'm going to go ahead and name a name cuz I just feel like it all right so Indian Rocks Baptist Church down about an hour south of here, the head pastor was the youth pastor for Adrian Rogers, who was a great preacher, okay? He was the leader of that conservative resurgence. I remember at that church, every single week, they played this Carrie Job song where, you know, they, they stand there and they're like hugging the microphone, getting all close like that, kind of holding their chest, those sensual whispers singing to Jesus, supposedly, I want to uh, lay at your feet, put my head, lay my head against your chest and feel your heartbeat. What kind of blasphemous trash is that, that you're going to talk about the, the creator and savior of the world and talk about and sing them some kind of sensual romance ballad? That's disgusting. So was it disgusting when John was leaning over on him when Jesus served the Last Supper, it didn't. It didn't describe it like that. Is it they, disgusting when a pastor waxes a shaft of an arrow at a youth conference in front yes. of hundreds of teens? Uh, okay, referred to about forty minutes ago in this conversation when I said pedophiles should be executed, and yeah, there were all kinds of warning signs there that. <laughs> There I were all kinds that. of Hey, we agree on something. That yes. could have been heated. Yeah. Well, you know, there's so much that you've said that I would love to to dive into. Um, one thing I would love to ask you, because you just, you know, you brought it up again when you were talking about Charles Stanley and his choice of Bible translation. Um, how is it you preach the King James Bible as a doctrinal issue? when there isn't a single verse about that in the entire Bible, God never endorsed any language translation, certainly not any English speaking translation being that English wasn't even spoken at that time. Yeah. So how is it that you hold the King James version as a doctrinal issue when there isn't a single verse anywhere in the Bible and don't go to Psalms because <laughs> God's language was not that he would preserve his words as if he were speaking about English, but it was that he would re preserve the poor. When that when that text is correctly, no, it's the Lord, preached. the words of the Lord are pure words. So I'm, um, and He'll preserve them forever. Okay. So that being said, also He'll preserve if, if the poor forever. Go there, let's go ahead to uh, Peter. Uh, we're born again, uh, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, and that is the Word of God. All right. I was I was saved under somebody preaching out of a chick trap. Okay. And that is <laughs> seed. All right. So let's get on to the next thing. 
I never felt anything reading the modern perversion that I could understand. I never felt anything sitting under preaching under modern, out of modern perversions. Even when I didn't understand the King James, bless God, I felt the King James. Hey, Nathan. God. Hey, Nathan. All right, so let's get off into something Nathan. else. I want to describe this. And as far as the, the doctrinal argument goes, as far as for King James only. Wait, okay. before you say that, let me ask you a question real quick. Is the yeah. standard is the standard for truth what you feel? Uh, the Bible, uh, Paul told the Corinthians that uh, that 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 the full, that the things of God are foolishness of the natural man because they're spiritually discerned. So obviously you're going to feel something, but I can talk about facts on that. I'm not just going by feeling. Okay. Well, you said it twice on here about you feel it with the King James version. If, if you're going to base if you're going to base everything on the King, I love the King James version, but the King James only ism is, is a totally if different somebody, thing. You said you were safe from a chick track. If somebody is, cause I don't use King James. So all those folks that have been saved under my ministry, are they truly born again because they were saved under a perversion? Okay. Am so, I mean, it, it's a difficult issue. It's like, if you went through the Romans road, you know, hypothetically, if funk, if 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 it's functionally said, if it's functionally saying the same thing, that's fine. But if you get into stuff like uh, straight is the gate and difficult is the way, that's works based salvation. There there are other verses like that that, that go there. So I mean, it's I, I don't I'm not one of those that thinks you have to only be saved through the reading of the King James, I think that's sort of a ridiculous position, but I do believe that it functionally has to say the same thing in those verses that God used to lead you because the Bible says we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. And that's the word of God. But I want to explain the facts of why to be King James only. Uh, if y'all have any more questions, I can hold that back. I was, I was going to ask you, Am I a true Christian pastor if I'm preaching out of a perversion? Answer <sighs> honestly. I preach out of the ESV, which I think is a very good. And I will make your brain explode, like you said. Version. I use the message. <laughs> Just kidding. I use. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I love that moment right there. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I I, I, I really want Christian you to standard. Yeah, I really want you to answer that question. Nathan. An answer that honestly, because it'll be about all three of us. I don't I don't want to say anything ugly, but I will say this: you, you, you're not you're not doing yourselves, and you're not doing your people any favors. So, so what makes the King James Bible superior? It's, it's, it's a foreign language in today's culture. Uh, even the translators themselves, they felt that there should always be new translations as they worded it in the preface, by the way, which is not included in the King James Bible intentionally. They believe that there should always be translations in the vulgar tongue. And I would also ask this question. How is it that men today feel stronger about the translation than the translators themselves felt about it? And then how do we feel about the fact that they worked for the government? They were the government priest because they wouldn't stand with those who were martyred. And so they worked for the government and they were, they were baptizing babies and they were basically a different form of Catholics as they were the Church of England. So how, how, do you, how do you believe that those men were suddenly inspired? I don't know if you believe double inspiration or not. But uh, there's believe, a semantic issue, yeah. Well, how do we believe those men were inspired when we wouldn't even say that they meet the qualifications today of, of true gospel uh, theology? How, would we, how does the King James Bible hold that level of superiority taking was, all of that into account. I'm so glad you asked that. Okay, so first off, I don't have to endorse everything that the translators believed because they didn't even endorse what each other believed. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, 
why are why are we so much more devout in defense of the King James than the translators were? Quite simply, because the attacks against the King James and, and the Word of God are so much more widespread and so much more perverse. That's the second thing. All right, so now. Let's go ahead and view the King James Bible. Oh, let's go ahead and view translations in general or versions in general uh, as a crime scene, okay? So first off, uh, look at the people involved in the translations, okay? So the King James translators were fluent in all these multiple, multiple, multiple languages. They even debated in them, okay? Whereas, uh, the, whereas these people who are supposedly Greek scholars they they sound like they sound they sound like they're speaking pig Latin with an with with a Midwestern accent. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. Hey Nathan, I, Nathan, I think yeah. I think this is one of the and we don't have time to get into an all out KJV debate, but I think what you're doing right now is the weakest argument for the King James Version because you're you're building the case on the character of the translators, where even the writers of scripture would tell you they're the chief of sinners. So the inspiration of God's word and the the authority of God's word doesn't come from the translators. That's that's the weakest argument I've well, ever heard. There's more to but, it. Yeah, I know, I know, but I do want to ask you this question. Hold on, hold on. Do you, let me, let do you, I can be brief. I can be brief. Let me finish the point. Okay. I, so I don't think you can. Yes, I can. I don't think you can. <laughs> yes, I can. I can. Okay. Uh, motive and opportunity. The King James translators undermined their own doctrines by leaving biblical baptism in Acts 8:37 in there, okay? Whereas the Gnostic perversions in the in the early church explain why 1 John uh, 5 7 was deleted, even though early church fathers attributed it. Uh, tamper, Catholic tampering explains why the modern perversions delete Matthew 23 14 that talk about the uh, the priest who or the, the people who fleece widows like the Catholic priests do, okay? And also the King James translators, there were so many conflicting doctrines and agendas that all disagreed with each other and they were all checking each other's work. It was foolproof. It wasn't it, it wasn't new inspiration. It was providential inspiration that the that it was foolproof that God had his hand on that, that there was such accountability, such expert scholarship and such that they wound up putting out a perfect product that is perfect and has stood the test of time. And it's so good that God can never do that again for another translation. I'm not saying he couldn't, but he sure hasn't. Okay, well, Brian? You know, I would just say this. Um, I think we could definitely get into a debate about the perfection of it. Um, if it were perfect and it were inspired, then I want to know why almost immediately uh, they had to reprint because there were thousands and thousands of spelling errors and other errors. You know, if God is going to create something perfect and he's going to use these perfect scholarly men to do it, man, God really made a mess of things because if God had done that through those men and that had been the perfect moment at the perfect time for the perfect translation, I don't think there would have been all those misspellings. And by the way, I love how we argue the 1611 when we know good and well everybody's carrying a 1769 and there were changes made from 1611 to 1769. So I think we all know that's true too. JC? Nathan, have you ever preached a sermon out of the Apocrypha? No, in fact, I'm quite, I'm quite pleased that the Apocrypha is not in it anymore. Uh, but that being said, the changes between 1611 to 1769, there were some, uh, there were some changes in the way the tenses were structured. There were some spelling changes. There were some font changes. There was, there were no sig significant changes. It if took I was the Apocrypha to... out. What's that? That's a significant change. It took the Apocrypha out of the 1611. But the King James translators never claimed that the Apocrypha was inspired. The Catholic Church didn't even do that until the time right. of the Reformation. But in the King James Version 1611, the Apocrypha was in it. Your hat, the King James Version 1611, it was in there, but when it was revised, it was not. So that's a significant difference between 1611 and the new revision. You talk about taking verses out, but then, that's I mean, they took entire books out. Uh, but, and, they were, and, but they were not Bible. They were not canon. Would, they, would God allow included, 
it was included in the book bound Would together allow something to say that these books were not canon they were reference materials in the same okay. way that my well study bible has okay. reference I have a really serious question for you here, and I think you would agree with this. Uh, in the King James Version, Matthew 5, 18 says, For verily I say to you, need, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I heard my entire life in the IFB movement that verse preached that you cannot change one dot or one tittle. You can't change one thing in the King James 16, 11. Do you agree with that? Okay, so first off, the King James translators were such honest men who understood the gravity of their work. Uh, no two languages, no two languages perfectly translate. Even though an English speaker could read French, you can't word for word translate French into English or vice versa. But that being said, so the King James translators, if they had to add a word. For, uh, for clarity and translation, they would put it in italics for the honesty of disclosing it. If they had to restructure a sentence so it would make sense, they would put it in parentheses to disclose it. I don't defend the King James Bible from a numerology position because that would imply that that, that might get me off into the argument of, of being cornered into saying that the English corrects the Greek, which it doesn't. It's just that it's a formal equivalent. Hmm. Okay. I just, I just heard that preached my entire life that one jot or one tittle, if one word is changed, then you don't have the word of God. Would you agree with that? If one jot or one tittle of, the Bible is changed. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that because the Bible says it, but you ha also have to understand that, that, that no two languages or even the most similar languages in the world, like English and French, are well, compatible just, for just speaking, Just speaking English to English, because I've got it opened up in an app on my phone, the King, the King James 1611, in that mm -hmm. same verse in Matthew 5, 18, it's different. It says, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one iote or one title shall in no wise pass ye from the law till all be fulfilled. So it's changed from the 1611 to the 1769. And yet I heard that preached my entire life that if you change one period, one comma, one spelling, that you don't have God's word anymore. Well, uh, what it comes down to is this. There's not a single verse in the Bible about an English translation. And what we have to believe at this moment is the Anglican men who believed in infant baptism and a lot of other things Proves my who, point. Re who referred to King James as the bright and the morning star in their opening um, preface. We have to believe that somehow those men were completely inspired by God. And yet, here's, here's what I will say. How wrong is it that God's word was preserved in, a English -speaking trans, in an English-speaking translation and God didn't say anything about it anywhere in the 66 books to point us in that direction so that we wouldn't commit the grave sin of not using it? Well, if you go to the book of Blues Brothers, uh, chapter 17, verse 69, it says the Lord works in mysterious ways. And, uh, and I mean, what it, it, what it means of preservation, the fact that the whole world today speaks English uh, tells me, and, and again, this is a matter of faith. Uh, because I believe the Bible and that, and that God promised to preserve his word. I just, and, I just got back from God, a missions trip in Nepal. I just got back from a missions trip in Nepal, and I can guarantee you the whole world does not speak English. Well, see, and I want to call out something else, too. You just said God promised to preserve his word. Where? Uh, Psalm 12. No, he promised to preserve the poor. It says that the words of the Lord are pure words that he preserved. Right. The Right. And, no, and no, no, he, no, Nathan, he was talking about the poor and he was saying his word would be true. You could count on his word. He would preserve the poor. You, it said, you need to look at the tense in that text. This, this is, this is indisputable. And the only people who exegete this text 
in, in a different way are independent fundamental Baptists who have the agenda of proving the 1611 to be the only inspired word of God. That and somehow, we all believe, we all believe that God does and will preserve his word amen. forever. But where did he say he would do that in one translation? When this was written, the word, the Bible that Jesus had was in different scrolls. It wasn't compiled into one bound book like we have now. It was yeah. multiple different manuscripts, multiple different scrolls. And when we force everything into our modern understanding of one version is all it has. I love what MacArthur says. We have an embarrassment of riches, an embarrassment of treasures when it comes to original manuscripts, when it comes to translations, when it comes to uh, fragments. We have more than anyone has ever had in history, and we're fighting a, about mm. one translation in God one language. God's not the author of confusion. Is Acts 837 Bible or is it not Bible? Look, the King James translators undermined their own doctrine by putting out a Bible that proves my point and undermines and disproves their point and their pet doctrines as Puritans, as high church Anglicans, etc. So that's, that, that's what I stand on. And again, it's a matter of faith. And, and, I, and, and again, there's a, mis, there's a big misunderstanding. Yes. Uh, the, the, the King James is formal equivalence. And, and, and look, if, if Jesus or the apostles were quote, okay, if the disciples were quoting uh, the, uh, the, the Hebrew text in Aramaic, that would have been an inspired translation. Uh, whenever the, the Hebrew was transferred over to Greek, uh, thus, uh, you know, as it is written, that's an inspired translation. Formal equivalence can be inspired translation. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. You're, I don't believe in pr using a numerological argument to defend my King James only position. So I'm not in the same. So I'm not bound by having to reject the Textus Receptus or what or the Masoretic texts. Okay. So I do have one question. Would your hat be more honest if it said KJV? 1769. Of course it is, but it wouldn't make you as angry. <laughs> it doesn't make me angry. I love that and answer. The truth will set you free. <laughs> but no, hey, it look, doesn't. I'm honest about it. I go out of my way. I go out of my way to say 1611 because it just, I know that there are certain people that just gets under their craw. <laughs> you know you're not with that right there you're not helping the fact that there are a lot of people on twitter that think you're a saturday night live stand-up comic like you're not real you're 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 fake you know i think this this episode will prove you're a smart man you you know what you believe and why you believe it and you know you're you're standing on that and so i, I mean here here you're not hey, I've fake got, <laughs> yeah i've got a question for you nathan how do you feel yeah. about I, ifb sermon clips uh using your clips how do you feel about that uh honestly it, it, well, i will say this it, it's it's extremely cowardly and gutter snipish because <laughs> ah, <go. I> mean, <laughs> this, this basement dwelling backbiter is sitting in his in his boyfriend's basement <laughs> editing his voice like he's on unsolved mysteries you know <laughs> spilling mob secrets i mean oh what my is, gosh. I mean, okay, and, and by contrast i'm one of these people who i mean we're supposed to shout it from the rooftops yeah. i have preached 10 sermons in my entire life and i had been put on ice uh, for years because I was at the center of a big scandal within the convention and I still put my sermons online and I try as I was trying to work through timidity and work out a preaching style and 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 all these reprobates and all these backsliders <laughs> and all these bitter feminists are projecting their imaginary childhood <sighs> onto me uh, as if as if I'm like a combination of Ted Bundy, uh, <laughs> Peter Ruckman, I'll say tongue. I mean, it, but it's laughable. I mean, I sit around and laugh. One of the brothers in our church, him and I sit around and make jokes about these people all the time, okay? I mean, it's hilarious. So, but so but here's the. Said, 
Now, I mean, does it annoy me that it's up there? I will say this. That's God. Um, so do you think of all the theologians out there? You know, theologian. You know, they... Uh... If there's something wrong with my preaching, uh, get on and critique it in the same way I put my name and my face out there and offer point counterpoints. That's the first thing. The second thing about it is, just from a practical aspect, it's really messing up our Google search results. <laughs> <laughs> hey. It's completely wrecked our algorithms. It's a mess. <laughs> well, Nathan, I can't believe you just offered that argument. That's really cool, actually. Um, but here, here's the thing. Stop and think about this. Would people know about you if it weren't for IFB preacher clips in the way that they do, I don't think they would. That's the only reason I'd ever heard your name. You literally have a cult following, man. People love you. I'm going to tell you this episode right here will possibly be the largest episode that we will have because there's so many people from IFB preacher clips that have heard just some of the craziness that you say in your sermons, and they're going to listen to this thing. Well, and I'll say this. I'll say this. You A minute ago, you referred to IFB preacher clips as – a backbiter. And by the way, I just want to go ahead and say this one more time. I am not IFB preacher clips. I'm so tired of being accused of that. <laughs> I have at this point offered to swear on the original manuscripts on my children's souls and everything else. But how can you refer to him as a backbiter when he only uses your words? Like this one right here, for example, this, if, if you, you preach this and then he retweeted it, Tell me how this doesn't gain attention. Uh, it says in this text to have a spirit of meekness and fear. That means you don't be a jerk to get enmity with God. The gospel is offensive enough. You know, so you can't be like these, uh, these liberal hipster Calvinists that the Southern Baptists and the Presbyterian <laughs> Church in America are popping out. You know, that just want to go tell everybody, God loves me. God hates you. Boo, 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 boo. <laughs> Don't work like that. That's false doctrine right there. Amen. What? <laughs> oh, my goodness. By the way, the punching and all that, and then the, the elbow, man, while that was being played, that was the best. That was so, a classic. So talk about that, that, little, that little brief blurb that we were able to hear. Why are the neo-Calvinists so obsessed with their perversion of Romans 9? Uh, Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? Uh, is the whole point. It's like they're more obsessed with the process of election than they are the actual work uh, of the gospel, the work of an evangelist, and the transforming power of the gospel. But just beyond that, if you actually look at uh, it, what is being referenced in Genesis, it's talking about nations, it, because Jacob, J Esau never served Jacob. In fact, Jacob labored for 20 years uh, and said, I am your servant, Esau. This is all yours uh, to preserve his life. And Esau was actually a pretty nice guy. The only big things you can find fault with him over is that he, is that he got sick, he thought he was dying, and he, gave, and he gave his brother the inheritance for a cup of soup. And, and, then he, and then he went off and married a bunch of Canaanite women. I mean, he actually seemed like a pretty nice guy. And the, Bible says, the Bible says that he sought repentance and tears and never found it. So God obviously rejected him. So, I mean, is God, did God get it wrong? Well, he sought repentance and never found it. Uh, that's one of those difficult sayings. I'd have to look it up. I mean, I haven't really thought about it that thoroughly, but at the same time, I will say this. You can't really find many texts. I don't know if he saw. I don't know if he saw was a saved man or not. That's a difficult question that it's not really clear on. It doesn't look good for him because he's a type of the world. But that. But that being said, if you actually look at who the cursed people were, uh, Esau seemed to be a pretty good guy who God blessed in his lifetime. It was the nation of Esau that was really the descendants of Esau that were really the cursed people. And also uh, the, 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 the descendants of Canaan were a cursed people, if you go back to the account of Noah and his sons. So the fact that 
Ishmael married a Canaanite, and then Esau married a Canaanite and an Ishmaelite, which was a, you know, a quarter Egyptian, a quarter Syrian, uh, Abrahamic, and half Can and half Canaanite, I guess. I, well, actually, I, I it, was it was it the daughter of Ishmael or granddaughter? I don't remember. I'm sorry, but anyway, uh, where I'm going with this is it's it's really it's one of those things where they re the Calvinists really abuse Romans nine, okay. <laughs> they really do. Well, okay, I'm, I'm wondering if God couldn't get past Esau's hair problem. I mean, think what 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 does it mean if you're known for being covered in red hair to the point that you know you can put animal skin on your arm to fake you're that guy? Man, that dude must have had some major body odor. I'm just I'm just putting that out there. I always well, you might have that. actually smelled better because because all that all that all that body hair would soak up the moisture. Whereas the whereas uh, the effeminate Jacob, uh, he he was he <laughs> the baby's behind, and there was nothing to soak up that desert sweat. Well, but, uh, I shaved, I shaved I my like arms. This. I shaved my arms, and Nathan looks like he's got Don King in a headlock, and I smell a lot better than him. I can guarantee you that much. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I have no idea what you just said for the last three minutes. I'm kind of lost. I'm sorry, but what I, I, what I do want to ask is, we played that clip, and I love it, but I think. And, and I just need to know, do you plan this stuff or is this just spur of the moment? Like, you, because there's got to be either in your brain, you're thinking, what can I say in this moment to get a clip? Because somebody's going to listen to this sermon and they're going to find a clip in there. Or does it just come to you naturally? Like going just, in a sermon. <laughs> I'm naturally kind of a quirky person. Couldn't I mean, <laughs> I will say. And you know, uh, in those in those early sermons when we were still in the in the boardroom in the conference room. Hey, Nathan, you, outline, you've said you've said my, early, you've said early sermons a couple times. How long ago was that? Well, that was that was uh, back last year. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, and you have to keep in mind our our church. We're having our one we're having our one year anniversary on June thirtieth. Okay, I mm. mean, but. It, but there was a lot that changed between when we uh, wrapped up at, in Tarpon Springs and moved up here because I completely changed my sermon prep. I completely changed the way I structured sermons. Uh, I, I stopped using nine page outlines and went to like little one page of scribbled bullet points. And also it was kind of a blessing for my delivery that I had that knee issue because uh, I wound up having to, uh, get on a little stool behind the pulpit, and I got a little more energy and unction, you know. I mean, but that being said, I'm just kind of a quirky person with a sense of humor. Uh, it's, that's kind of how stuff like that happens. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, uh, a, a little Barney the Dinosaur song was not in that nine page outline. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have, I have a, I have a request for you, Nathan. Sure. Could you, could you possibly work in? the van down by the river sketch into one of your sermons. <laughs> I don't, I've heard people say that. What is that? <laughs> My name is Matt Foley. I'm 37 years old. I am divorced and I live in a van down by the river. <laughs> Thank you. Just look it up. On, <laughs> look it up on YouTube. It's hilarious. It's a Saturday night live, not live sketch. It's, it's hilarious. And then my second question, we send all of our guests a recovering fundamentalist t-shirt. Would you preach in a recovering fundamentalist podcast t-shirt? I, I wouldn't even preach in a polo shirt, but I will <laughs> say this. I would preach in it underneath my white shirt. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ah. That would be really cool. Hey, can we play a game? Well, we've got to close this up and wrap this up. Let's but could do it. we could we play a game real quick with you? Uh, Brian, sure. JC, I want you guys to join in with this. I want to say like uh, uh, a short word or name something, and you give us a one word answer of what you think about these things. Okay. Yeah. For for example, I say King James sixteen eleven. Hey man. Okay. Uh, so so let's do this. Um, John MacArthur. pompous jackass who thinks you can take the mark of the beast and be saved okay that's more than one word but we'll take it do okay. you guys have one kanye west you have a one word answer for kanye west nathan 
Oh, Kanye West. Uh, false prophet on drugs. Okay. All right. MLK Day. Straight out of hell, false prophet. Beth Moore. Being a woman preacher is heresy. Damnable heresy is what comes out of her mouth. Andy Stanley. Dad should have whooped some doctrine into him. NIV. Positive. Thotomites. <laughs> Uh, preaching in jeans, a flannel shirt, and flip-flops. God never called the people of Portland to preach. <laughs> <laughs> Hipster. Young, you're restless and reformed. Liberty University. Jerry Falwell fell away from the old time religion. <laughs> All right, I've got one more. Paul Kidd, Phil Kidd's son, who's nothing like his dad. I'm glad I don't approve of his direction, but I'm glad his dad still loves him. That was fun. Thanks, man. I got, I got one more. Contemporary Christian music. Babylonian, sensual, carnal, erotic, uh, strange chords, effeminate, weird. Well, for all of those genres, you can go to jradio.com. Jradio.com is one of our sponsors here of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We are so thankful that they sponsor the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. They have a genre like you can. I don't know if any of those genres are on there, but Effeminate is Brian Edwards' favorite, and it is on there, and you can find it today by going to jradio.com. Nathan, I don't know how to end this, man. I'm not going to lie to you. This is the <clears> longest <throat> interview we have ever done. Uh, we started at 9.30. Right. It's almost 12.30. This is awesome. I absolutely well, love it. Well, Go listen, ahead, Brian. Listen, Nathan, I'm going to ask you a favor, and yeah. this is going to involve asking JC and, and the other Nathan a favor. We're almost going to have to do a second interview with you to cover those other reasons we're not uh, that we're not fundamentalist anymore. Yeah. And this, this episode is going to take a lot of editing um, because not to make you look bad, but just like a couple of my questions were <laughs> stupid and that, that gunfire messed me up really bad, guys. I apologize for that. No. But I almost think if you're willing to come back before this episode airs, I think we need to finish it out, play those other clips, and – that way Nathan will have the best choice of everything. If I'm if I'm the odd man out, then just this vote me out. No, I'm I'm fine with doing that in the future. We'll see how this one goes after we edit it and then see how we want to come back and do it again. The only I do want to saying, say, Go ahead, Nathan. I was just going to say, I, I want to say you, you have thick skin and I appreciate you coming on here and and handling our questions respectfully. And I'm sorry it's so late, too, Nathan. Yeah, I used to be an evangelical who was dumb enough to get a tattoo because nobody ever preached the devil out of me. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, what hey. is your tattoo? <laughs> it was... Uh, a rebel flag. I got a cross. Okay. Oh, that's and a, and a confederate flag. <clears throat> there I knew it. it. There I it knew is. It. <laughs> so, so, so um, Nathan... You are crazy funny, man. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing, too. I used to be in a lot of meetings with Tony Hudson. Um, you're far more intelligent than he is. Um, he wouldn't have been able to have this conversation and describe things like you did. Um, and I want to say something. I want to say something to you personally, Nathan. Uh, mad props to you for coming on the show, and I respect that. 
and I do think you're intelligent and I do think you're, uh, it's admirable that you will have conversations with people that you disagree with. But I honestly, from the bottom of my heart, want to plead with you and beg with you to seriously pray and look at the movement that you're mixed up with because it's dangerous, man. I, I want to see God, the gifts that God has given you used for positive. And that's just a warning from a brother that has been and seen the darkest of the IFB movement. And I'm not saying that everything is evil in it. I think there's a lot of good churches, good pastors, but just from one brother to another, be careful, man. I, I think, I, th I think you got to focus on the gospel and stay away from all the peripheral things. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I certainly appreciate your candor in giving that opinion. And, uh, you know, hey, on the bright side, as my Bible college president told me, uh, being down here in Tampa Bay, I'm literally like an island down here. So, I mean, <laughs> if I am a part of am if I am a part of the movement, I mean, it's it's only theoretically because I'm like probably to ten hour drive from it. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, but hey, I'm I'm game for coming back on. I'm I'm always up for doing stuff like this. Uh, I don't I don't I don't find any profitability in uh, R4 and no more. It's like if 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 you have the gumption to walk up and t tell a total stranger on the, on their doorstep that they're going to hell, I mean you, you can have a conversation defending your beliefs. Well, I hope you were I hope you were fine with us, and uh, I think um, I think all of us are passionate about our perspectives, and so. It's really cool that we were able to have the conversation and uh, what are you preaching it, on tomorrow? It came from it basically he, uh, taking it at face value. You saw an ugly side of uh, fundamentalism that I didn't see. But then on the flip side, I saw an ugly side of evangelicalism uh, and had to come out into fundamentalism. And, and I've reached out to other people like you who have had similar stories. And I can't really uh, – there's – I still believe in my doctrinal truths and my practices and everything in the old time religion, but there, there probably is something there that fundamentalists could work on to prevent a falling away. So yeah. that, that's why I always want to talk to people like y'all. And let me say this, um, you know, if I'm completely honest with you, mm -hmm. um, I long for the day there's no such thing as an independent Baptist church. Um, I'm not speaking that against you. But we grew up on the inside of that movement. We were, we were the family who was well known in the movement. I sat at the table with the men tonight that you referred to as your heroes. And we're not in person, but Nathan, I can look at you in the eyes and tell you they are not who you think they are. Uh, they're not admirable people. I heard sad conversations around the table as a kid that caused me a lot of great confusion. And I am not ex-fundamentalist because it was convenient. It cost me a ton. I'm ex-fundamentalist because in the same way that God sent Moses to set the children of Israel free from Egypt, God, through his word, set me free. It was, it was transformation prompted by the scripture. And that's why I'm no longer fundamentalist. So all I can say is the people who hoop and holler in the seats, they don't understand the movement behind the movement. I would certainly like to have a private conversation with you about these things, but it's interesting that you bring that up. I, I cause I, I feel what you're saying because my, I don't want to get into too many details. My path was paved and I lost everything to stood to stand where J Frank Norris stood a hundred years ago and defend the fundamentals of the faith. And that's how I ended up here. Right. Well, and I think J Frank Norris, was cut out of a different block of wood than modern day fundamentalist. I do too. I agree. With he that. didn't have that crass speech 
that that vulgar speech for the sake of getting a standing ovation at the end of every line. And um, and by the way, I'm, I appreciate you taking what I said a few moments ago as well as you did because I'm not speaking against you or your local congregation. Um, and in the same way that I would say that about an independent Baptist church, I would say that about a Joel Osteen type movement and um, a lot of others who yeah. would be well known in in the what I would refer to a seeker friendly world. Well, all I can say is I'm a person with young children. I, I can't be mad at you. All I can do is listen to you because I need to learn what it's going to take uh, to keep the next generation in the old time religion. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Nathan, for your time. Hey guys, I'm going to jump off here. I know it's late and yep. uh, Nathan, you, what time are you preaching tomorrow? Uh, 11 a.m. Uh, it, it just so happens that I'm preaching uh, uh, about when the angel came and visited Joseph. We're working our way chronologically through the life of Jesus. So uh, we're, we're kind of starting awesome. this here. Well, Nathan, we thank you for coming on tonight, man. And uh, we okay, look forward to having you back chat. on here. Yeah, let's talk next time. Next, Let's talk next time. We need to hash these things out. All right. We'll do it. You're going to be a regular on here. How about that? Good to me. All right. Take care, gentlemen. All right, guys. Thank you, sir. Thanks for All listening right. to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We'll see you next time. Be sweet. Peace. There we go. Nathan, we appreciate you, man. I'll be in touch. We'll, we'll set a time and uh, get together and continue to talk. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. It's, hey, I'm, I'm up for these things. Well, tell yeah. you what, thank you for letting, letting you stay out this late. They're not there at the church with you, are they? No, no. Okay, good. I, I specifically drove to the church, think you know, because I don't want to keep the kids and the wife up. Yeah, I got you. All right, bud. We'll be in touch. All That's right. It, man. Man.